quite intelligent young girl. Very devious. Plodding through life in the 60s. She was all for herself. She's one evil so-and-so. Innocent, vulnerable, in need of love and care and attention. She's an evil cow. She's got the devil in it. She's the devil itself. Wasn't we lucky? Little ones that got away. Crimes committed by Moore's murderer, Myra Hindley, shocked the nation. Hindley has been demonized as the most evil woman in Britain. With her lover, Ian Brady, Hindley took part in the abduction, sexual abuse, torture and murder of five innocent children. She was sentenced to life imprisonment. Hindley's supporters claim that she would not have been capable of murder without the influence of Brady. With the help of criminal psychologist and forensic profiler David Holmes, we aim to delve into the mind of this infamous killer. Was Hindley indoctrinated into Ian Brady's murderous world, or was she quite simply born to kill? When it comes to the born to kill argument, Myra Hindley is very interesting because she is actually reputed to have had a very normal childhood and then have met this very macabre stranger who then transformed her life into one of evil. Now, that is a very simple story which requires further examination. Myra Hindley died in prison on November the 15th, 2002, after serving 33 years. She was 60 years old. Myra and Ian might have carried on torturing, sexually assaulting and killing children if it had not been for one man, David Smith, and his confession at Hyde Police Station on October the 7th, 1965. David had witnessed Ian brutally murdering their fifth victim, Edward Evans. The final murder they committed was that of Edward Evans. Uh, he was uh, a teenager and Brady and Hindley had um, met him on Central Station and persuaded him to come back to the house with them. Myra said that Ian picked him up for gay sex. They brought Edward Evans back, and the next and most interesting thing about this death and the thing that actually stops the whole cycle of killing is that Ian told Myra to go and fetch David Smith. David Smith had the reputation of being a neighborhood hard man. He'd started dating Myra's sister, Maureen. They got married and moved to the nearby Hattersby estate close to Ian and Myra. The four of them spent a lot of time together. David was impressed by Ian's right-wing views. Slowly, he became indoctrinated into Ian's perverse view of life. Myra went and, and brought David Smith and brought him, him back to the house, whereupon Edward Evans was murdered in a very, very brutal fashion. He was much bigger, it was much harder to kill him. There was blood everywhere. It was a very, very nasty death. Brady had been grooming Myra's brother-in-law for several months and was confident he could trust the 17-year-old to not only keep a secret, but also to become actively involved in their murderous plans. But Brady miscalculated David. Eventually, Edward Evans was killed and he was, his body was parceled up and wrapped up. And they took him upstairs with great difficulty and locked him in a bedroom. How much David Smith was involved in the actual killing, he says not. Um, but he said he had to do certain things because Ian was controlling it and forcing him to. He said he had to do what he had to do, clean up and help Myra and Ian, and Ian that night. And he had to help them to do everything to save his own neck. Then he went back home and told Maureen what happened. With a large carving knife to protect them, they went down to the phone box and they phoned the police and they stood in that phone box until the police arrived and the pair of them were really, really terrified and horror struck. David Smith gave an account of what had happened on that evening 
And Myra wasn't present during the physical murder. She was actually in the kitchen. But she was certainly involved in the cleaning up of the house afterwards because, as you would imagine, there was a, an awful lot of blood. And uh, I think it's fair to say that David Smith had certain views about her thoughts at the time. They were flippant remarks about blood and tissue around the room. The crime scene of the murder of Edward Evans was a grossly blood-splattered affair, in the midst of which Myra Hindley was projecting herself as a laughing, gay, busy housewife, tidying up a normal domestic scene. She normalised what was grossly abnormal. For this particular scene, it helped her to distance herself from the reality, the horror of what she was engaging with. David and Maureen's story was taken seriously by the police. Two dozen officers were called to Ian and Myra's house. David Smith had warned them that there were guns on the premises. They decided that they would do this in a sort of undercover way. So when the knocker went and Myra Hindley answered the door, it was not a policeman on her doorstep, it was a bread man with a basket of bread loaves. Myra said, we don't have bread. And then he said, but I'm a policeman, and they went inside. The police insisted on searching the house, which they resisted, but eventually they, of course, had to accede, and the body of Edward Evans was found. Little did they realize but the police were about to stumble across one of Britain's most notorious criminal cases, the Moore's murders. Straight away, Ian Brady was arrested, but Myra Henley was, having been questioned, she was allowed to go home. Um, they didn't believe she was involved. However, because of David Smith's insistence that there were probably more children, more murders involved, um, the police continued to investigate, and they searched the house very thoroughly. They actually found a list of, which Ian said was, was the planning for a robbery, and it had enigmatic initials on it, and one of them was PB. And eventually, down the spine of a prayer book, they found a ticket for a left luggage office at a station in Manchester. And they found out which one it was and claimed a suitcase back. The majority of serial killers take some form of trophy of their crimes away from them, whether it can be rings or it can be jewellery or it can be a hair. And it was in this suitcase that they found all the photographs and the tapes of Leslie Ann Downey's last few minutes on Earth. Um, Brady and Hindley were not unusual. Um, they uh, tape recordings of the torture and the murder and the pleadings of Leslie Ann Downey. Ten-year-old Leslie Ann Downey had mysteriously gone missing from the area six months earlier. David Smith told the police that Ian had joked about burying children on the moors. Eventually, with the use of the photographs that, Myra, that had been taken of Myra with her dog and Ian up on the moors, they managed to actually find a place where they thought that they might fruitfully start digging for bodies. Myra was arrested and charged a few days after Ian. Um, her dog, Puppet, was also taken into custody because the police knew that if they could establish the age of the dog, they would be able to establish when some of these photographs were actually taken. A vet put the dog under a general anaesthetic and was trying to establish the age from it, its teeth. And tragically, Puppet died, and Myra Hindley was heard to scream around the police station, murderers. As a result of um, uh, the tip-off that they were digging on the moors, I was a very young reporter, and my job was to drive around at night in the hope that I might see police digging. Saddleworth Moor is quite a, an eerie place at the best of times, but to be up there in, in the early hours, in the dark, uh, knowing that you know, there, there could be, at that stage, could be children buried out there was quite weird. Quite frightening, really, looking back. There was a, a whole cavalcade of press um, parked down the hill and not allowed to get near. Um, and they tried to do as much of it as they could under cover of sort of dawn and, and dusk, but it was very difficult because you have to have light on the moors. The moors are vast and spooky places. Police believed that the bodies of four missing children might have been buried on the moors. Their fears were well-founded. On the 10th of October, 1965, the body of Leslie Ann Downey was discovered. Eleven days later, the body of 12-year-old John Kilbride was also uncovered. John had disappeared without a trace on November the 11th, 1963. 
1965, a case like this was unique. For the first time in British history, a woman had been implicated in a killing partnership that involved the serial sex murders of children. What had turned Myra into such a monster? Was it a question of nature, not nurture? As the details began to emerge, particularly in the local community, there was a sense of well, outrage. I think if some people could have got their hands on Mara Hindley and Ian Brady, they wouldn't be here today. It's quite a, difficult to comprehend what they got up to and got away with for so long. To satisfy the born to kill question regarding Myra Hindley, you have to examine the whole of the period of the killing, but perhaps more importantly, you have to examine the childhood and the aspects of childhood, and you're looking for little events that might say that this person was showing signs prior to the crime period of being born to kill. Had she not met Ian Brady, I'm absolutely convinced that Mary Hindley would in all probability have led a normal life. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley were sadosexual killers. These particular murderers become hooked on inflicting torture on their victims. Their pleasure is gained in a perverse game of cat and mouse, stalking, entrapment, and killing of their quarry. In the case of Brady and Hindley, their favored prey were children. What normal and everyday person could watch a man sexually abuse a child, torture them, strangle them, murder them, and dig a, a shallow grave on the moors and put them in it and walk away and sleep at night, which she did for many years. So how did a seemingly normal child grow into an adult so perverse that she would gain pleasure from the sexual abuse and murder of children? When looking at serial killers such as Myra Hindley, you have to very carefully examine not only the period when the crimes were being committed, but look very carefully at the childhood in order to separate out those things which may be clearly environmental, those things that may have been biologically there all the time, and those interactions between them. Myra Hindley was born on Thursday, July the 23rd, 1942, just another child in a world of terraced houses and factories in the poor working class area of Gorton in Manchester, England. She was part of a, a close northern community. She knew everybody in the street. She knew the people at the shops. She, everybody knew everybody. She went to the same school as all her friends. Um, it was very supportive, loving local community. Myra was the first child of Bob and Nellie Hindley, initially a placid child who was no trouble. When her sister Maureen was born four years later, the situation changed. Mr and Mrs Hindley found bringing up two children too difficult and sent Myra off to live with her grandmother. Some people try to make a lot of the fact that she didn't actually live at home with mum and dad, but she lived, you know, in the next street with grandma. The two houses could see each other from the bedroom windows, and she spilled between the two houses. It was a very, very loving life. Myra went to the local state school. She went to the junior school where she was bright and only narrowly failed her 11 plus. Granny was very susceptible to allowing her to have a day off if she wanted one and, and Myra's attendance record was very poor. And had she gone, she probably would have passed for the grammar school. As it was, she went to Ryder Brow Secondary Modern. She was in the top class. She did extremely well. <laughs> she was in that vanguard of youth culture and she was very aware of it. It was the beginning of teenage as, as a phenomenon. Rock and roll was there, Beatles were coming. She changed her image slowly but surely. Thick makeup, like a Dusty Springfield. The hair got blonder. Big curls in the hair. The skirts eventually got shorter. Always had all the top fashions. Well, it was fantastic. She uh, um, peroxide blonde, always did uh, very well for the lads. 
Myra had one friend of the opposite sex from quite early on, a little boy called Michael Higgins. She was quite taken with the idea that he had the same initials as her and they used to hang out together, go everywhere together. Um, she used to be sort of almost looked after him. Myra felt she'd made a lifelong friend. One sunny afternoon, Michael asked Myra to go swimming with him at the local reservoir. She was unable to go. Tragically, Michael drowned, an unfortunate event that local boy Lawrence Jordan witnessed. Michael Higgins came with some of his friends and they were swimming over that side. And then all of a sudden there was a flurry of excitement and one or two young kids running round saying, I can't see him, I can't see him. Somebody must have dialed the police because two or three policemen came running up and we saw them diving. And one child said, there's somebody under the water. Somebody then shouted, oh, they got him. And I saw them bringing out this chalk white body. But you can see the whiteness of the body against the blue uniforms of the police. And his arms were outstretched almost in a, a crucifix. They hurriedly then put him in the mortuary van and the van then passed us going out where you could get down to it there. The path came to there. It must have been really traumatic for Myra Hindley because if she was a friend of his and she saw him being brought out, that would obviously stay with her for the rest of her life because it certainly stayed with me. And after that, she went in a shell for a while. She was absolutely devastated of the fact that he died. Um, she wasn't the same girl for months and months after that. In fact, it was a year or so, yeah, yeah. a long time. She went and visited his parents, his mother, all the time, and she actually converted to Catholicism. Michael had been a Catholic, and she actually converted in the wake of his death. With Michael, she invested quite a lot and lost quite a lot. And to some degree, although she might have blamed herself, she also blamed everyone else. And this was the beginning of the distancing of her from other people, and also, Within this, she would hide in religion. This was another step away from humanity and towards a new kind of aim and career. It was not long after Michael's death that Myra left school. On her 17th birthday, Hindley became engaged to Ronnie Sinclair, a local boy who worked at the co-op. However, Myra's apparent contentment with her ordinary life didn't last long. Half the time, Myra wanted the, the sort of classic husband and two kids, which all the girls around her aspired to. But there's another part of her that really didn't want to do that. Being brought up by her grandmother to have a certain sense of self-importance, Myra Hindley did require more from life than simply 2.4 children and a marriage. Uh, this would not be stimulating to her. For some women, they require a certain amount of violence, a certain S&M quality to their relationship, and Maya was of this type. Eventually, she landed a job as a typist secretary at Millwoods, which was the place where she ultimately met Ian Brady. Ian Brady was working in the office at the time. He completely ignored her for many, many months. Uh, he was aloof. Uh, she describes him as an extremely good-looking individual. He was always well-dressed. Ian was, a, say, quite an attractive, handsome. He used to have this big motorbike that everybody wanted to sort of, like, go round when your kids and have a go of it or look at it. And, you know, I think he was just mesmerised by it, wasn't he, really? Yeah. There wasn't very many motorbikes in Gordon at the time. She very, very quickly came to be absolutely fascinated by him. And the perfect example of this is she kept this very childish diary in which she wrote things like, he looked at me today. Ian spoke to me today. Ian is in a bad mood today. He's not looked at me today. He has looked at me today. Will he take me out at weekend? At best, Ian Brady was bisexual and probably rather more homosexual than heterosexual. So she was very much on the periphery of his vision. Until the famous Christmas party when they, uh, 
they got together and became an item from there on in. Uh, and it was at that stage that he started to uh, to indoctrinate her into his, uh, his his views on politics, life, sex, and so on. That first night, Brady took her to see the Nuremberg trials. As the weeks went by, he played her records of Hitler's marching songs and encouraged her to read some of his favorite books, Mein Kampf, Crime and Punishment, and the works of the Marquis de Sade. Hindley happily complied. She had waited for so long for something different, and now here it was. Myra's family were not keen on Ian from the very word go. Ian's background had been more dysfunctional than Myra's. He was born in the centre of Glasgow as a result of a, an affair between his mother, a waitress, and a man whose identity we've never been completely sure about. And he was fostered, when he was about two, to a family who were living nearby. And they brought him up to the best of their ability. However, when he became a teenager, he began to get involved in crime. Eventually, the courts in Glasgow said that he had to go and live with his mother, and his mother at this stage was living in Manchester, so basically Glasgow shipped its problem out. Brady became Hindley's first lover, and she was soon totally besotted with him, soaking up all of his distorted philosophical theories. She went from this happy oh, lucky girl to not wanting to speak to anybody, not wanting to be with anybody, it was always you shout Auntie Myra, because as I say, everybody was your auntie. You'd shout to her and she'd completely ignore you. She became involved in all his strange sadomasochistic sex. He, he didn't have um, a normal sexual appetite. Brady told Hindley there was no God, so she stopped going to church. When he told her that rape and murder was the supreme pleasure, she did not question it. Her personality had become totally fused with his. I don't think Ian was in love with Myra. I think it was just what he was doing, really. I think he was playing cat and mouse like he's done all the way along. Early in 1963, Brady put Hindley's blind acceptance of his ideas to the test. He began planning a bank robbery and needed her to be his getaway driver. Immediately, Hindley began driving lessons, joined the local rifle club and purchased two guns. The robbery was never carried out, but Brady's purpose had been fulfilled. Myra had shown herself to be a willing partner in crime. He had so many wonderful dreams and schemes, and she was obviously very, very impressed by him. Um, unfortunately, uh, what Brady actually had in mind was the destruction and torture of children, uh, and she got swept along with it, and the poison infected her. And that was how they embarked on their first murder. Pauline Reed was on her way to a dance. She'd left home dressed in her pink party dress. Myra knew her. Uh, Myra pulled up in, in the car alongside her and asked um, Pauline if she would come and help her look for a glove. And it transpired that Myra drove her up to the, to the moors with Ian Brady following on his motorbike close behind. And what we do know is that Pauline got out of the car, presumably went to look for the glove with Myra, and that Ian Brady then came up behind and, as far as we know, hit her with a spade and killed her and sexually assaulted her. But to kill Pauline and to walk around the community knowing that everybody was looking for Pauline and held her head high. She didn't even blink, she didn't... Nobody had an inkling or anything. Almost. Pauline was a dangerous one because they did have some connection with her. He knows that the way to do the murders is to pick up children because they're easy, Myra to do the picking up because that is much the easiest way of doing it, and to do children that they do not know. So that takes them on to meeting John Kilbride. John was the oldest child. He was almost 12 when he went missing. The last time I saw my brother John was in 1963 on a Saturday morning as I got up. What I used to do every Saturday was going out the market, saw all his pack away. He just never come home that night. My mum rung the police about half past six, because he was always home for six anyway. And I mean, he was always home, so half past six, the police were wrong sort of thing. 
he was missing. Yeah. There was posters all over the towns far and wide and Ferry John's face on lamp posts, placards, shop windows. Have you seen this boy? There was a pub on the corner called the Bessemer and there was um, photographs of missing children in the area at the time. Have you seen these children? And she used to go to the bar and have a drink, knowing that them children was there, and knowing she knew exactly where they was. In their statement, they said they'd picked him up at Ashton Market. Well, Inley had. She'd led him to Birdie's car. And again, he was sexually assaulted. He was found with his underpants tied down at the bottom of his legs. Um, and buried again close to the road. I think after just a few weeks, we all realised he wasn't coming home. He's, we, we knew he hadn't run away and we knew something had happened to him, but we didn't know what, not for two years. The role that Murray Henley played was always one of, of the initial contact with the child. Uh, sometimes Brady was was absent and came along later. Or uh, on other occasions, Brady was behind on the motorcycle and he was flashing the headlamp to tell her, there's one coming up now, stop and talk to this individual here. Last time I saw a kid on the 16th of June, 1964. Their method of abducting and killing children worked. Myra and Ian were driven to try it again. Six months later, they chose 12-year-old Keith Bennett he went to his grounds, or he should have gone to his grounds, and he didn't get there. He was walking down Plymouth Grove West, across Stockport Road, and into one of the side streets. She'd seen him at the top end of the entry, so she went round and collared him and picked him up, said something to him, and he went in the car, no messing, because he thought he was doing a good turn to somebody. So when my mum come down on the 16th of June, I said, where's Keith? She said, I don't know. I said, well, he should have been at your house. And then I thought, well, I better go to the police station and tell them. And they said it'd give you 48 hours to get back. I said, well, where could he be? I said, he's not gone with any mates. I said, he never does that. I said, he comes straight home from school and that was it. But he disappeared and that was it. Two months after, the police come to the door with Brady and then this photo. He said, well, we think it's possible that these have had something to do with Keith's, you know, with Keith abducting him. There is a slight difference with Keith because they take him deep onto the moors. At least three quarters of a mile, which is quite a long way for a small child. He hit him on the back of the head, knocked him out, and then put a, a machine cord rub around his neck and broke his neck. And um, he actually assaulted him afterwards and left the clothes at the side where they buried him. But he didn't know he was going to his death. By this stage, Ian was living with Myra and her granny in Hattersley, which is an overspill town near Hyde, just outside Manchester. And they moved in, and the neighbours were very impressed by them because Ian got stuck into making a garden, did up the house. The word yuppie didn't exist in those days, but if it had, these would have been seen as a kind of upwardly mobile young couple. A further six months passed before the next abduction. The fourth victim was Leslie Ann Downey, a young girl that they picked up at a fun fair in Manchester. And Myra, again, persuaded her to come in the car, and they took her home. This one is different because they took her back to their house in Hattersley. And there hasn't been an enormous amount of scope for torture and taking photographs and making tape recordings. But now that they've got a victim actually in their own house, they can indulge in all of that. And they run a tape recorder, and this tape recording is, in fact, perhaps one of the most shocking things you will ever hear, but it is also the thing that completely condemned Myra Hindley in court. Her voice is heard on the tape, um, and it's telling the little girl to be quiet, because clearly she was very distressed indeed. 
and they, she explained that she was very worried at the time that the neighbours might hear the little girl crying and that was the, the, the concern. And Leslie Ann Downey is pleading with her, please, Mum. She calls her Mum all the way through her, so by appealing to Myra's maternal instincts, she might make this whatever awful things are happening. But Myra is gagging her, ties a gag around her. Um, we don't know what abuse happened. Myra claims that there was no sexual abuse. Um, there probably was. And the next day, they took Leslie Ann Downey up to the moors and buried her. The killing of Leslie Ann Downey marked a significant change in the killing career of Myra Hindley. The risk and the confidence to actually kill somebody within feet and inches of neighbours rather than out here on the moors. It would be another 10 months before Leslie Ann's body was discovered on the moors in a shallow grave with her clothing at her feet. Even with the damning evidence mounting against them, Brady and Hindley denied murdering Leslie Ann. As in the case of Edward Evans, they attempted to implicate David Smith. They claimed that Smith had brought the girl to the house so that Brady could photograph her. As far as they were concerned, Leslie Ann had left their house unharmed with Smith. Ian Brady tried to protect Myra, and it's true that if Myra had played it the way he wanted it to, she would probably have been charged with being accessory and possibly been out of prison after seven or eight years. But she was determined that she was in this with Ian. All she said was, Ian is innocent and I am innocent, and she said this over and over again. The evidence that linked Brady and Hindley to the murder of John Kilbride, while not as overwhelming, was sufficient to charge them. They found the name John Kilbride in Brady's handwriting, written in his notebook, and a photograph of Hindley on John's grave on the moors. I actually got ready myself to go and help on the dig, and I was uh, more or less locked in my bedroom by my father. A couple of days after the police came with a shoot, my mum identified it as being John's, and they found John's body then. Despite all their efforts, the police were unable to find the bodies of the other two missing children, or any evidence to link Brady and Hindley to their disappearance. Ian Brady was charged with the three murders uh, of the ones the, the police had the bodies of. That was Leslie Ann Downey, John Kilbride, and Edward Evans. Um, Myra was charged with Leslie Ann Downey and Edward Evans. And of being an accessory to the killing of John Kilbride, Ian Brady received three life sentences and Myra received two. Myra was taken to Holloway Prison. I put them all in a big enough hole to bury the bloody lot of them, throw acid on them and then throw the soil on top of them and burn them alive, because that's all they need. Because them kind of people are not worth the salt of the earth, not as far as I'm concerned anyway. In order to evaluate the degree of influence Ian Brady had on Myra Hindley's criminality, you have to examine the point at which they were separated. Myra Hindley's behaviours will indicate whether or not he was the causal factor or whether or not Myra Hindley was born to kill. Ian Brady's hold over Myra Hindley continued for the first few years of their incarceration. They constantly wrote to each other and even requested permission to marry. The rift that developed between them was gradual, stemming mainly from their differing responses to their imprisonment. Brady quickly accepted his sentence and soon settled into prison life, whereas Hindley continued to assert her innocence, maintaining her claim that Brady and Smith were responsible for the murders. I really said she didn't have any involvement or me. In her words at the time, was acquiring the children for Ian Brady. But she was distinctly heard on a tape of Leslie Ann Downey telling the little girl to shut her mouth. While Brady was, God knows what he was doing to do. Her mother was convinced she was innocent. Her sister was convinced she was innocent. Everybody around her was convinced by Myra that Myra had just been Ian Brady's dupe. 
Myra Hindley's mind, the story was in place regardless of her innocence. And she would gather together anyone who would listen, give her time, and certainly anyone who would give her any publicity that might support her plea of innocence. In 1970, Hindley broke off all contact with Brady. His hold on her was completely broken by the realization that she would never see him again. Seven years later, more than 10 years after her imprisonment, Hindley began a campaign to win her freedom, a crusade that continued until the day she died. And Brady's never actually applied for parole. He was willing to serve his sentence. At least he knew what he'd done and he didn't want to come out of prison. My Hindley applied for parole on a regular basis, just to torment the families, as far as I'm concerned. Hindley's application for parole was delayed for a further three years. When Hindley's plea was finally heard in 1985, 20 years since she was first in prison, it was rejected. The Home Secretary announced that Hindley's case would not be heard again for at least another five years. Ultimately, she hoped uh, she would be able to get out of prison, and that was probably uh, her long-term objective. At the end of 1986, Hindley changed her tactics. Instead of continuing to plead her innocence, she made a full public confession. A conjunction of people came together in Myra's life. She had a solicitor who was saying to her, unless you make a clean breast of everything, admit it, and then possibly down the line parole will be possible. At the same time, she was being counselled by Lord Longford to, to make a confession. She also received a letter from Winnie Johnson, the mother of Keith Bennett. When I wrote to her, she said she was very sorry that she couldn't help me in any way. She was watching out for Brady on the hill. And she wasn't, she was as bad as him. She watched them kids murdered and she watched them being raped. And at the same moment, because Ian Brady had made a sort of confession to a journalist, the Home Office ordered Greater Manchester Police to reopen the investigation. Well, the aim was to review the case and see whether there were any fresh lines of inquiry uh, we could pursue with a view to, first and foremost, finding out whether two children might have been buried, and secondly, of course, gaining confessions. She now admitted both the knowledge of and involvement in all five murders including those of Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett. She was cooperative right from the word go and said that she was prepared to point out to us areas of interest uh, to Brady on Saddleworth Moor, which was really code for giving us a pretty good steer as to where bodies may be. When it emerged in the 80s that there could be two more bodies on the moors and there was a likelihood of either Hindley or Brady turning up to try and pinpoint them, there was what you would call a, a newspaper frenzy. Many newspapers hired helicopters. I was up there. It was chaotic. She was very keen on trying to help us. I have no doubt about that at all. You have to realise that for Myra Hindley, this was actually keyed off by her lawyer saying that unless she did appear to the public as a reformed character, that her release would probably never, ever happen. Therefore, can you disentangle her self-interest in doing this from any genuine, apparent remorse that was revealed? She pointed out or identified the areas that we'd already been searching. It was not until the following spring that we actually started excavating those two areas. And of course, in the summer of the following year, we found uh, Pauline Reed's body in one of the areas that she'd highlighted. And they found Pauline Reed. Now, I met her mother, and she's a lovely person. Oh, she was a lovely person. And she used to always say to me, "Win it, they will find Keith. I know it, they've got to find him, and they will find him. He's been missing now for 41 years this summer. I doubt whether they will ever find his body, because they say that the landscape moves and changes in, in that time. And Keith's mum, Winnie, is absolutely obsessed by this. She says she can't rest until she lays her boy. She has even been up there with a spade in, in, in that forlorn hope that she could find her boy. I love it up here because I know Keith's up here watching me. Other than that, 
I wouldn't come up, but I know he's up here, and I know he knows I'm up here, and he knows I'm putting flowers on the, the fence for him. No matter what hell or fire, I'll have him back. He shouldn't have been up here in the first place. I've been up on the moors quite a lot in my lifetime. And it's, it's just not a nice feeling. It's not a nice feeling at all. But at least we have got a wee John where we can go and visit. Winnie Johnson still looking for her son. After 40 years, she's still looking for her son. Keith's body has never been found, but Hindley's confession has given his family some indication of how he died. Hindley had lured him into the car with a request for assistance in loading some boxes. Once at Saddleworth Moor, Brady had taken Keith down to the gully, where he raped and then strangled him, burying him somewhere nearby. At the time of her confession, Hindley's solicitor expressed his belief that her chances of parole were greatly enhanced by her display of remorse. In 1988, uh, she approached me to see if I could represent her at a time when she was making a number of important legal challenges to the High Court. And people said, well, look, Andrew, you've got to be careful. This is the most manipulative woman in the country. Be careful she doesn't manipulate you. Well, I've had many clients over the years seek to manipulate me. I can say Myra never did. Myra Hindley, as far as I could see, was an extremely clever and manipulative woman who managed to play the establishment to her own ends and draw people to her cause. The criminal justice system has always recognised that if you change and if you reform, you should be granted parole. All the experts were of the opinion that she had reformed. If you want to understand Myra Hindley, you have to compare her prison career with that of Ian Brady who became a tortured man. Um, Myra Hindley did not. She became a well-spoken, articulate defender of her own innocence. But I believe that she changed back from that evil persona to a genuinely sorry uh, woman for the dreadful crimes that uh, she had uh, committed with Brady. What she hoped to gain by applying for parole, I don't know, because she could actually have been charged with the murders of two more children. And this is what I'd have pushed for if she'd have got parole. Whilst in prison, Myra rediscovered her faith in Catholicism. She continued to express remorse for her crimes. I asked people to judge me as I am now and not as I was then. A lot of people turn to religion in prison uh, to impress uh, one group of people in particular, and that is the parole board. Uh, killers, every killer in America must be on a journey into the light, must have seen Christ, and the first thing they do on a Sunday is queue up for tea and biscuits in the church. Her uh, aim in life was to walk free, and she wouldn't have been free very long. I'd have loved her. I'd have loved it for him to drop her on Aston Market or outside my front door. I'd have loved it. I'd have served time for it. I'm certain in my mind that if Myra Hindley had never met Ian Brady, she would never have been involved in murder. She would have moved heaven and earth to do anything um, to please him. You could call it a tragic love story, but I don't think you could put the word love in this. Um, not when you think what they did. Without the influence of Ian Brady, it is very, very unlikely that Myra Hindley would have killed another person. However, her searching for a stimulating, exciting life may have ended up with her being with some drug dealer, some uh, bank robber, who would give her an exciting life, but wouldn't necessarily have involved her in one-to-one -one killing. Just haven't got words to explain how I feel about her. That sort of thing just did not happen where we lived. On November the 15th, 2002, at the age of 60, Myra Hendley died from respiratory failure, arising from a serious chest infection. She'd suffered a suspected heart attack two weeks earlier. She 
got the devil in it. She's the devil itself. In this particular instance, Myra Hindley was not born to kill, but she was placed in a circumstance where an element that she was born with enabled her to continue and kill. Who's to say she could be here? Maureen, David, all of them could be here. You know? Still living in Garton. Still living in Garton. And then again at the other side of the Could Colin. be married. So could Pauline. Her own yeah, of course. She could have been here as well. She could have been here.